And just when we thought everything was going according to plan, things actually get better. Nvidia come out with a double beat, surpassing consensus expectations by a lot and actually raising guidance. Semiconductors in the after hours are pumping as are most growth sectors. And is there anything that can break the AI bulls? That's what we're here to talk about today. But it wasn't all good news. The Fed minutes left a sour taste in the mouth of the market. And while Nvidia can be the tide that raises all boats, the economy is still the greater ocean. So what exactly was said during Fed minutes that caused the market to sell off after 2 p.m.? And is the economy as robust as the data suggests? So today we're gonna dive into the Fed minutes as well as the federal budget earnings and we'll be taking a deep dive into GDP and all of its components as to get a full picture of where we stand and where we're going. And of course, the S&P 500. We'll be looking at key levels and indicators and I'll be giving you my forecasts for the week and for the rest of May. Will we go higher or will we go lower? We've got a lot to talk about, so let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell. Guys, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. So this is the daily heat map of the S&P 500. So a pretty red day across the board. In large part, it had to do with a couple of earnings that we got pre-market stuff like Target. It was down 8% that really weighed on staples that really weighed on the market as a whole. We also got some pretty hawkish Fed minutes. The market didn't like that. The Fed talk about persistent inflation pressures and needing greater confidence. Some of the Fed minutes actually saying, if need be, we can go ahead and will go ahead and hike rates. But it was a very weird day of trade because we saw energy, real estate, basic materials, essentially inflation hedges. They did really, really badly. And that's because obviously of commodity prices and then real estate here about hiking rates. Utilities didn't get any love today. Market participants opted for telecom services, consumer defensives, at least in the package goods areas as well as healthcare for their defensive names but there were a couple of bright spots tj maxx starbucks pika csx and sc that had a bit of upbeat action with regards to earnings and upgrades we also saw software buck the technology trend along with infrastructure tech and that really did help the tech sector as a whole as well as this part right here in semiconductors look at m chip on adi very very strong days three percent four percent ten percent and that really did help push semiconductors intraday but nvidia did fall about half a percentage point leading up into its earnings and we're going to talk about their earnings a little later other than that it was a pretty red day across the market the s p 500 did fall 0.29 percent and those stocks that gained were actually igv barely industrials communication services healthcare technology and semiconductors on the back of some of the smaller names really just rallying the worst performing sector was actually gold miners and that had to do with commodities as well as rate sensitive names look at itb kre xlre they're obviously going to fall when you hear talks of potential rate hikes because of inflation you know they're going to get hit the hardest you're going to rotate from those sectors into defensives into maybe healthcare into maybe technology you know companies with great balance sheets but let's actually quickly talk about what caused a lot of the bearish price action today here in the S&P 500 and it had to do with FOMC minutes. Now, for the most part, the minutes were pretty much the same. You know, the Fed saying we need greater confidence. Growth is robust. Employment is robust. The economy is chugging along as usual, but we still need greater confidence because of inflation. Certain components are keeping it high. But two outstanding parts of it was various Fed officials mentioning raising rates if inflation warrants it. That's obviously going to have a tangible effect on the sentiment of market, as well as officials discussing holding rates steady for longer if inflation doesn't fall. So potentially higher for longer, potentially raising rates if need be, especially coming into Fed minutes where Jerome Powell was a little bit dovish at FOMC to see this type of price action takes the market a little bit by surprise. And that's why we got the price action we did in the S&P 500. The price action I'm obviously talking about is this massive sell-off we got around the 1 p.m. area, which is when the FOMC minutes happened. 1 p.m. in some states, 2 p.m. in others. But you see, we actually trended mostly sideways waiting for this big data event. There wasn't much of anything going on. Then when we got the hawkish minutes, we actually sold off. You can then see that bulls did come in at the lows up until 4 p.m. And then we have this massive candle here. This is the after hour trade after Nvidia dropped their earnings. Now, Nvidia posted a double beat. They beat EPS of $5.58 on $6.12. And that was on revenue of 26 billion versus the street's expectation of 24.59 billion. At the same time, Nvidia also announced a 10 for one stock split, increased its dividend 
and it was beat across the board the stock was up four percent here in after hours and the market really did like these earnings from nvidia and that's exactly what i said on twitter i thought the best way to play nvidia today was long and from an options perspective it was a bull credit spread that was your best bet and in the after hours that trade is money now diving more in depth into nvidia's earnings we can actually see here that visualization part of revenues missed other than that it was beat across the board from free cash flow to eps we actually saw gross margin expansion you can see the actual right here 78.9 the market was expecting 77.1 so we did see slight margin expansion relative to what the street was expecting as well as operating margin expansion 69.3 versus 66.8 we also beat on revenues by 5.4 percent that's very very big and then we also increased guidance so it wasn't just a double beat it was a raise consensus guidance was 26.82 nvidia guided for 28 billion we also guided for a higher gross profit of 21.14 billion versus 2020.29 what was concerning right here is that this gross margin has likely peaked for nvidia you can see the street was expecting 50 75.7 percent in gross margin the consensus nvidia said it was going to be closer to 75.5 and then operating margin came in line with expectations this is the peak for nvidia's margins part of this rally was predicated on yes increasing revenues increasing profits also that we did see this margin expansion over the last four quarters we saw a healthy margin expansion that is not going to be the case next quarter maybe they do get to this number maybe they do beat and that would be up and up but we are very close to the top in margins here in nvidia and that probably means the stock is nearing its fully valued status that being said great earnings 10 for 1 stock split and nvidia will probably continue to rally into its next quarterly result now, looking at the rest of the market, we can see that the S&P 500 was down 0.27%. Same with the NASDAQ, Dow Jones, RSP, mid cap, small caps, IWM. This was during normal hours trade, as well as growth and value. They were all down on the day. This had to do with the negative Fed speak. However, if we actually look at the SPY, you can see we're a little bit upbeat here in the after hours, thanks to NVIDIA's earnings. Or well, same here with growth. If we then actually go to sectors, we can see that the semiconductor index is up 2.29% in the after hours. Technology up 0.52%. XLC communication services up 0.21%. The KWeb, China's internet ETF, up 0.16%. So NVIDIA being the tide that's lifting all boats in the growth sectors, but then these value sectors right here, not doing too good in the after hours. So definitely a day where you want to hold growth. And that's probably going to continue into tomorrow's trade. Now, looking at the S&P 500, this is the daily chart. We can see some very glaring things. A lot of people call this an island top. Maybe we are topping. A lot of people will see that as a bad thing. I actually think it's a good thing. What we are doing is trading sideways and forming a bottom here at the 52.95 area. This white line is actually the gamma flip zone. From yesterday to today, the gamma flip zone moved up in a very, very big way. Now, this can be seen as a good thing and bad thing. Number one, we are trading above the 52.95. That is a good thing. We had great NVIDIA earnings. That probably means the S&P 500 is probably going to move higher tomorrow, especially the NASDAQ 100. But we can see quite a bit of volatility if we dip below this 52.95 area. And we'll talk about key levels a little bit later on. But as long as we trend sideways and hold this 5300 area, we're actually working off a lot of the overbought conditions, as you can see here in the RSI. And that's really a good thing, because let's say we trend sideways, work off some of these overbought conditions. Then when we move back into overbought territory, that's just a tailwind for equities. But let's assume tomorrow we do actually fall below the 5295 area. We get into negative gamma. Some of the algos, the options traders take hold. Dealers start hedging their portfolios. And we do have a sustained move to the downside. What is the areas of support that we want to look at into the end of the week, into next week? Well, the very first level that I'd be looking at is this level right here, okay? 52.49, let's just call it 52.50, and that's a very key level because we use it as resistance right here. We then actually broke above with this very, very strong candle. So if we do pull back, I think we're going to see a lot of strong support here at the 52.50 area, and then we're going to bounce higher. I wouldn't talk anything below that. If we do get to this area and we do get below it, then we'll talk to lower levels. But until this 52.50 area is actually broken, I favor more upside. I favor support than upside. If it does get broken, we'll talk about key levels a little later on. But I actually do think we're going to find strong support if we do pull back here. But based on NVIDIA's earnings, I don't think that's the case. I think the floor right now is this 52.95 area. We could see this wick right here, this wick right here. Bulls like this area, and we probably are going to go higher into those NVIDIA earnings, especially the NASDAQ 100. But that's also going to depend on rates. What we saw with the 10-year yield today was actually some very, very interesting price action. We saw a green-bodied candle. 
that's for sure. But we saw a lot of the bears come in at the top here, despite the Fed minutes. So what the Fed says and what the market thinks is going to happen, not quite matching up, but still a green body candle nonetheless. Again, I do favor a move here to the 43.12 level and actually us to break below. I think that's definitely going to happen in the very near future. And I think definitely in the June period, we're going to see a sustained move lower in rates, especially when we get the PCE data towards the end of June. I think that's going to be cool nonetheless. One thing that's very weird is that TLT longer duration rates did actually increase on the day. The action in the after hours not looking that great, but intraday is really what matters when it comes to the market. And we did see commodities slip a bit and that did deter commodity sectors. Look at oil. It was actually down 1.39% today. And then we actually saw gold. Gold had a massive down day, down 1.74%. And that did affect commodity driven sectors like GDX. Silver down 3.75%. And you know, the market can't just keep doing this forever. We do need a bit of a pullback. And I do think that if we are going to look for key levels in silver, I think looking at the 29 level is actually a very, very good level to actually find support and then continue the move higher here in silver. If you want a key level here in gold, the 2300 area, and then pretty much where we are right now. So if bulls don't hold this area, we probably break below, use as resistance, and then move lower to this area right here. But I am still bullish on commodities for the most part. Looking at Bitcoin, I think what Bitcoin is going to do is that we tested this area right here, this very key 71.52 area. If we are going to pull back, we should find support at the 66 level, find support, and then continue the move higher. If we do break below and move down, we're going to have to meet this trend line, and then we can bounce from there and move higher. So Bitcoin still has a lot of room to pull back into this is kind of looking bullish but what bitcoin bulls really need to do is break above the 7152 area you guys find a bit of resistance here pulled a bit back what the bitcoin bulls need to do is find support and then push above here use it as resistance and then make a move higher to new all-time highs that is the playbook for bitcoin same with gold and same with silver this isn't a reason to get bearish on metals we're just having a bit of a pullback a bit of a consolidation period in those names and then crude oil is doing its own thing. I think crude oil is close to the bottom here at 77. And I think we're just having a bit of price discovery at these levels. We do have the OPEX meeting in June, a very key meeting. So I think the market's probably going to trend sideways ahead of that. But you have the key levels here for the S&P 500 and my expectations. I do think we're going higher ahead of these NVIDIA earnings. I think 52.95 is probably going to be the floor. And we're probably going to move higher towards the 5400 strike into the June OPEX. And looking at European earnings growth, it's really great that we got the data for this now. The stock 600 year-over-year -year growth rates for the first quarter year 2024, we're looking at negative revenue growth, negative earnings growth, 4.1% and 2.3% here for the first quarter. We are starting to see these inflect. We are probably going to see the stock 600 leave the earnings recession here in the second quarter and then onward and upward, especially double digit earnings growth here in some of the back half of 2024, early 2025. So hopefully the earnings recession is done here in the stock 600 and we should see European earnings power higher. And we're also seeing the Europe buyback yield hit its highest levels ever or just below its highest levels ever. Now this is the buyback yield index, but essentially what this number tells us is that 4.09% is the earnings buyback yield of European companies. Now, a lot of this is because they just trade at a deep discount. You know, Europe trades at about 13 times forward, whereas the S&P 500 trades at 20 times. And that's why the buyback yield is actually 4%. But that is very, very attractive because we also know that Europeans, we also know that European stocks for the most part pay pretty good dividends, anywhere from 2.5% minimum plus. And that's because the majority of European stocks is just industrials and banks. And they tend to pay more dividends. And what this tells us is that Europe is actually quite an attractive investment. You're getting a great buyback yield. You're getting a great dividend yield. You're getting quite the undervalued stock portfolio that's poised to go higher if earnings do materialize as the market is expecting them to over the next couple of quarters. Now, something else that's supporting equities is actually the crypto market. Now, this supports equities in an inadvertent way. It's sort of like a risk on indicator. It also allows for more liquidity into the market. Now, the next block of ETFs to get approved is Ethereum. We're starting to see Ethereum price absolutely rally on spot ETF rumors. The SEC has until Thursday to decide if they're going to approve these spot ETFs, and it's looking like they probably are. We're starting to see the presidential campaigns get behind crypto. Trump's campaign begins accepting Bitcoin, Ether, and other crypto donations as a byproduct of this. We're starting to see the, the Biden campaign do the same. The Biden administration is easing up on crypto. They're probably going to work with the SEC to get these products 
into the market if they do get approved. And I do believe that this is just the Biden administration reacting to Donald Trump's recent embrace of the industry. In fact, the Biden administration up until recently was anti-crypto. And in fact, I do believe the Biden administration said they were actually going to veto the approval of spot Ethereum ETFs. So to see this drastic change and positive regulatory developments is quite sudden, but I do think it's welcome for the market as a whole. It is a risk on figure. It does increase liquidity into the market. And I do think net net, it is an overall positive for the market, you know, looking well, well into the future. Now let's talk about sentiment. You can see that CNN's fear and greed index is right now at 63. Just one month ago, we were in the fear zone right here at about 30 in just a single month we've moved into the neutral zone into the greed zone and now we're hovering still at this greed zone however we haven't really touched extreme greed the closest we've been so far in the last year or so is about the 65 maybe the 75 area for a couple of weeks but that's really been it and essentially what this is telling us is that the markets can go higher and it's a great time to own exposure to equities and we're in greed sentiment because the market keeps pushing higher and that is likely to continue. This is S&P 500 performance after 12 month high is made in May and the subsequent returns June to December. And the June to December period out of the 27 times this has happened is positive 23, only four losses, 7.58% return. And we can actually see that the June, July, August and September period tend to be very hit and miss. 15 and 12, 17 wins, 10 losses, 16 and 11, 14 and three for the months June, July, August and September respectively, with average returns ranging from 0.32 to 1.29%. We really start to see outsized positive returns in October, November and December, boasting a 19 and eight win to loss ratio, 20 and seven in November, 20 and seven in December, 1.66, 2.26, 1.42% return in the months of October, November, December. And these three months make up the majority of the 7.58% return from June to December, along with the July period, which just sees exceptional returns for the most part. So essentially guys, you want exposure to equities and you probably wanna to look to the June, July, August, September period to add to exposure for the end of the year run, which is normally very, very positive. And that normally starts in October, November, December. And I would say actually the closer towards the end of October. And that's probably why we're seeing excessive levels of greed. When you see stats like this, more upside tends to ensue. Now on this channel, we cover the S&P 500 a lot. And that's normally the benchmark we use for everything. But what you have to understand is that most benchmarks follow the S&P 500, don't actually beat that benchmark. Only 13% of fund managers on a rolling three-year basis have actually outperformed the S&P 500. And if you look at international funds and large cap funds, I would say that 80 to 90% of equity fund flows in ETFs are in these two components right here. Anywhere from 13 to 22% of fund managers have actually beaten their performance benchmarks. This is probably the VTI performance benchmark. And this right here is the SPY performance benchmark or the SPX. So to see drastic underperformance on a three year rolling basis when we've had pretty much a bull market for the last 18 to 24 months is actually quite surprising. And it's not just these two sectors, large caps and international funds. We see the same here with the US active equity, mid caps, emerging markets and small caps. However, small caps, 69% of funds outperforming the benchmark. That's actually pretty good. It is very hard to outperform these benchmarks. And that's why for the most part, you do want the majority of your portfolio, the core holdings of your portfolio to be the ETF, track the SPY, track the NASDAQ 100, track the VTI. So don't go paying fund managers high exorbitant fees to underperform the market. Just keep it simple, buy the SPY and just dollar cost average every single week, every single month. Now, part of the reason why we've seen this drastic underperformance actually has to do with fiscal and monetary policy. You can actually see here that from 2015 all the way to 2019, I would say maybe 2018, monetary policy has actually been fairly tame. You know, it was neither hawkish nor dovish, slight tilt towards the dovish side. It was really after COVID, once we pumped a bunch of money into the system, had drastic rate cuts that we actually saw quite a lot of volatility in the hawk of sentiment score. And essentially, this just tells us that monetary policy was being tampered with. And that's why we're seeing a huge discrepancy between the doves, between the hawks. And this has done things to the market in the last five years that we never ever thought would happen. We saw a blistering rally in 2020, 2021, when most of the world was locked up and the economy was virtually in the gutter. We saw the highest unemployment ever. And then we saw one of the craziest drawdowns in 2022 and then a blistering rally in 2023 into 2024. So it's been a crazy, crazy time. And that's why in times like these, and even in times like these, it's best to just buy, hold, do nothing, and reinvest those dividends.
Now, the economy continues to hang in there. The Fed's GDP now estimate for the second quarter 2024 is sitting at about 3.6, maybe 3.5%, which is very, very elevated compared to the blue chip consensus. And this is essentially telling us, based on the data that the Fed gets in, that the market normally doesn't have access to, things are running a little bit hotter than expected. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, because if we have higher growth and disinflation still continues, that may actually be very, very good for the economy. And that's going to be very, very good for stocks because it means we can get earlier rate cuts, stronger growth. The purchasing power of consumers increases as a result. Government pays less money on their debt. That's less interest expense, less deficit. And that is actually a very, very robust economy. But breaking GDP down into its segments, we can actually see residential investment as a percentage of GDP is actually below the average of 4.4% at 4%. Business fixed investment is actually running very, very hot. That just has to do with a lot of government money circulating via the IRA, via the CHIPS Act and other such fiscal measures. We can also see here that light vehicle sales continue to power higher, especially from these COVID lows. That's part of the reason why we're seeing auto insurance costs skyrocket. But we are starting to see that level out ever so slightly here in the last couple of months. And hopefully insurance costs do come down because it's one of three components that's really keeping inflation elevated. The other part being shelter and the other two components being food and energy. And then total business inventory sales ratio is actually at 42 days below the average of 43 days. So not necessarily terrible data right here. Everything is looking really, really good, maybe except for residential investment. And I do think this has to do with the rate cut situation. The second we get rate cuts, the second yields come down, we should see residential investment increase robustly and probably well above the average of 4.4%. Now, looking at the federal budget, let's start off with SIBO's baseline economic assumptions. They see real GDP growth in 2024 of 1.8%, fairly standard. Most banks and real estate investment firms are expecting about 2%. 2025, 26, 2.1%. 27 to 28, 2.1%. And then 2029 to 2034, 1.9%. So fairly robust real growth for the next 10 years. They actually expect the US Treasury yields to fall from where it is right now, 4.6%, all the way to 3.8% here in 2028. That's going to coincide with headline inflation continuing to disinflate all the way from 2.6% to 2.2% .2 here in 2024 to 2028. And then the unemployment rate is actually going to tick up incrementally where it is right now at 4.2%. This is end of year assumptions. Right now, the actual unemployment rate is 3.9%. They see this materially increasing over the next 10 years from 3.9% to 4.2% to 4.5%. And I think this actually has to do with the amount of immigration happening in America. And as a result, you're naturally going to see a higher unemployment rate. Now, looking at federal net debt as a percentage of GDP, now SIBO's baseline forecast at the end of 2024 is at 99% which is historically high and going back to as far as the 40s. It's never been this high before, except for this part right here when we were in a world war. And SIBO actually expects this to increase in 2034 to 116% of GDP federal net debt. And we have some expectations here as high as 124% by the year 2034. So not really sustainable. So this right here is total government spending, essentially what they're spending your tax dollars on and how they're actually financing themselves to run the government. You can also see here that we have percentages and this is essentially the percentage makeup of financing as well as total government spending. Now let's actually have a look at US government spending. So non-defense spending, discretionary spending 15%, interest on debt is 13%, defense is 14%, social security accounts for 22%. That is kind of crazy. Medicare and Medicaid, 25%. So social security and healthcare are roughly the same. And then we have 11% accounts for all other stuff. I'm assuming that stuff like roads, government utilities, et cetera. And then these are the sources of financing. You can see that 24% accounts for borrowing, which is essentially just increasing the government's debt that they have every single year. So right now the US economy is fairly healthy, but things are starting to trend in a way that we don't really wanna see here with debt, here with the federal deficit. We can see since 2008, this has been increasing in a very big way. When it comes to the economy as a whole, these issues don't just show up out of nowhere. They take time to develop decades to develop. Eventually there will be a reckoning because this and this is completely unsustainable. But as everything looks right now, not looking at future projections, the US economy is in a very healthy, robust state. 
The federal budget is in a healthy and robust state, but things are deteriorating and not getting better. And if things deteriorate enough, it'll eventually lead to the collapse of the US economy. Now, looking at gamma, not much has changed at all, but there are some very key things we do need to take into consideration. 5400 is still the core resistance. The put support actually moved down ever so slightly. Very interesting to 4950. Oftentimes, we normally see this move up as the gamma flip and core resistance moves up. So to see this move down 50 points is very, very interesting. We also seen quite a lot of negative gamma come into the tape. And I think this is probably traders in the last 24, 48 hours, just entering a bit of protection ahead of Nvidia's earnings. If buying protection is really cheap, why wouldn't you buy some protection ahead of what could be a very volatile event? So that's the type of thinking I guess traders are looking at. But we are starting to see negative gamma build here in the 50, in the 5,000 strike, 4,950, 5,100. So this could be a little bit concerning. This could be a little bit of foreshadowing that maybe we do pull back. However, there's still significantly more positive gamma in the tape. 5400 is still the core resistance and we're still above the gamma flip zone so we'll be buying dips selling rips looking for the 5400 area ahead of june opex now just data in the week ahead so we got the fomc minutes today so tomorrow we're getting initial jobless claims as well as the pmis for manufacturing and services as well as new home sales and then on friday we get the durable goods as well as university of michigan sentiment now looking at the pmis we're expecting 50.2 for the manufacturing and then the services coming in at 51.6 initial jobless claims is expected to come in at 218k and then these are the durable goods figures both the consensus as well as both as estimates that you guys can go and have a look at. We'll cover that in tomorrow's video. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video, and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.